Right, hello, hi, I'm Zoe Darlington um, and welcome to the um, Climate Change Forum at the Business Insights Festival. Um, I'm here with a, a good panel today of um, experts in the field. Um, we have a Rod Roderick Hebden, Derek Kattenbach, um, Louise Halliday and um, John, what, what's your surname John again, John? Buck Oak. Book Oak, that was it, Book Oak, yeah. So um, I work, I help um, manufacturing and engineer, engineering businesses become lean and green um, through operational and efficiency savings. Um, and yeah, we'll go around the room. John, if you go first, if you want to introduce yourself and what you do. So we supply, we're an equipment supplier and we supply equipment to help businesses both reduce their energy cost and the cost risk associated with energy and also their emissions, whether it's carbon or other emissions from energy. Excellent. So next one, Rod. Uh, so yeah, I'm Roderick Hebden, founder and director of New Elements. Uh, we're a consultancy based in Swindon, Century Universe, uh, and we support small and large clients with ongoing strategic projects linked to practically delivering public goods. So that often uh, has a climate change environmental component to it. So I've got a background in science engineering and I used to work as head of corporate partnerships for the National Trust, who are Europe's biggest conservation charity. Excellent. And um, Derek? Hi, good morning. Derek Hessenbach. Uh, I work as a consultant in renewable energies and air purification. So I help businesses of all sizes um, to achieve the green energy revolution with solar panels, with um, wind turbines with battery storage, and also to clear up the mess from the air that we breathe. Excellent. And Louise, you're an observer, but we've just pulled you in. So you, you, if you want to introduce yourself, go ahead. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> you can tell I wasn't expecting to speak today. Hey, um, hi. Hi. I'm Louise Halliday. I work with Roderick uh, at New Elements, and, and as Rod said, we we work um, mainly with very small businesses, helping them to con consider their social impact, uh, their environmental impact, and also to tell those stories in a way that's meaningful to their customers. Um, often people are already doing really good stuff, but they haven't clocked it or they haven't known how to engage their audiences with it. So that's a really big part of what we do is just helping them think through their, their impacts across every area of their work. Excellent, excellent. Okay, so the, the discussion is going to be quite informal. It can go anywhere. So I've just got a few topic points, which, you know, we'll try and work through, but we don't have to stick to that. And, you know, don't, you know, don't worry, we can go, we can go anywhere with this topic. So I think the first one is climate change. Um, so what is perception? What is our perception of climate change on an international level? So, so what's your views on climate change and how is it, you know, from an international business point of view, what, what are the big subjects? So we'll go, John. It's an opportunity. Yeah. Um, like anything in business, business is about problem solving fundamentally. And it's an opportunity to get a competitive advantage on others who are not seeing the market opportunity um, by, behave, by changing business behavior internally. So in our case, it's energy. Yeah. And then telling the world about it. Yeah. So I was interested in what um, Louise had to say about telling the world. It's not just about the cost saving. It's about the promotion. It's about the PR. It's about the, the, the differentiation of a product rather than, oh, it's just about this or that. It's, a, it's an opportunity to, to grow and beat your competitors. Be first to the, be first to the, past the post with your competitors. Do you think it's still, I mean, you say it's an opportunity and clearly it is for the green economy and whatnot, but do you think in general it's considered an opportunity or do you think it can be considered a barrier? I'm thinking of businesses that I work with that quite often might think that actually this green stuff's just a just pain and it's going to stop us from doing things. Well, it depends on the business. If you're in oil and gas or coal mining, definitely. Yeah. Um, but the writing's on the wall for those guys any, anyway. So they need to change. Otherwise, they'll go extinct. 
Um, but also, I think it's it's quite a fuzzy um, fuzzy topic. So many people don't see the link as to in terms of what they do and how it they can influence change. So as individuals, as private individuals, in our purchasing choices, we can influence change by buying electricity, for example, from Ecotricity, a Gloucestershire-based company. They do domestic, commercial, and industrial energy, and they invest in in a new generation capacity, not certificates, which is a a kind of a bit of a weird thing. Um, but then you could also talk about it in your employer, about the opportunities and explore technologies as well. Not just stick with what's known, what's always been done. Look curiously at technology to find out what can be done within the economic framework to make a difference. Yeah. So what's your thoughts, Derek? Um... What's your thoughts on technology and opportunity? Is it an opportunity? I think it is for you. It's certainly an opportunity. <laughs> I mean, I, I have always dealt with technology. Um, and the fact is that, that we're moving in a direction that is a known plan. We know that we're moving towards um, electric vehicles, which will require the technology for the charging, to get rid of the um, range anxiety and things like that. And, and from my perspective, I'm, I'm providing an opportunity for businesses to, um, to, to actually future proof themselves towards the known rather than the unknown. Um, and, and when you can, can fix the pricing of your electricity for 20, 25 years by, uh, you know, by encompassing all of the technologies that are there, and when you can do that in a way that it's not going to affect your, your profit margin, your top line, your profit and loss, where it can be funded purely from the value of the, the generated electricity, um, then, you know, why would a company wait and why wouldn't they want to be involved in something now that they know, they know that they've got to move towards that? So. It, it is an absolute advantage for, for the technology side, for, for companies, businesses, big and small, to, to be involved in something like this, because everybody's got to play a part. Even if it's a very small part, we've all got to play a part towards it. Do you find, <laughs> business, do you find businesses want to play a part? Is it, I mean, what, what's stopping them? Most of the businesses you talk to, do they actively want to play a part or do you know most of them have had these ideas for quite some time and shelved them because they thought they couldn't afford them yeah they they've also had this situation where oh it's a real faff i've got to talk to this person to do this then that person to do that then i've got to find somebody to go and do this and actually that's genuinely not the case you know you 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 can have a vision of what you would want to do whether that might be you know, a whole bunch of solar panels on the roof of your facility, um, solar power charge points, um, car carports with EV charge points built into them. You can do all of these things now, but companies don't realise it can be done without digging deeply into their own pockets. So where do they get the money from? Is the finance there? The Absolutely. I, 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 I have to qualify this. At the moment... I have a ceiling of 50 million pounds per project. Right. And underneath that, we're pretty much good to go for, for anybody with a reasonable sized project. Yeah. Okay. So it's, it, so it's possible for any business. Pretty much so. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much so. You know, there is always, there is always that tipping point when you're looking at, at the financing of a project of, is it worth your while going through a finance route for it? Or is this something because of what could be a relatively quick return on your investment complete, um, whether to advise them with your hand on your heart that actually this is better out of your cash flow or whether it's mm -hmm. worth going down that route. But one mm -hmm. other thing that people are, are not really catching on to at the moment, which needs to be highlighted, is that in the last budget, for capital expenditure on equipment like the renewable energy side of things, um, there is now an, an offset on taxation of 130% of the project cost. 
So they're actually going to be paying you for putting the technology in. That's no, and that's perfect, isn't it? And that's, that's something that's you know. I, and it, do you think that businesses understand that at the moment? I mean, what? I mean, do businesses know that? No, no, <laughs> no because that. the message hasn't been got out there in an efficient enough way, either by government or, with the greatest respect, by myself. Because you, yeah. you know, you've 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 got to create your audience when something new happens. And when the first yeah. of April came round. You know, th this this was launched on us um, up until March 23, I believe. Um, so we've only had a month or so to be able to to get this across to people. Everybody, but the momentum's you, building. Yeah, do you think everybody's distracted by coronavirus as well? That a lot of the big things are just not making it through. Coronavirus and freedom. I can get outside the house. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, Ro um, Roderick, um, I, I left you till, well, not last, but I know that you'll have a slightly different spin on it. So um, what's your perception of climate change from a, from a, from a global level? What, what are you seeing? What are the big topics for you? Yeah, I think it's, it is interesting. And I think the, um, the framing of it as an opportunity is right for business in the sense that there are huge opportunities to go out and tackle it. We are problem solvers. Um, I think we have to be real and recognise that the reason why that exists is because there is a problem. <laughs> Um, and that problem is not being, uh, will not be felt equally in all parts of the world. Um, so there will not be, there will be countries and governments that are, you know, in, in the world who don't see climate change as a, a great opportunity for business to innovate. They see it as a real and immediate threat to loss of life uh, and loss of way of life. Um, and so we do have to recognise that. And, um, and I think the threats that come with that do affect uh, businesses in the in the UK and, and outside those areas. So you might it might be that you you're lucky and your business is in an area where brilliant there's grants for innovation. Uh, we can we can do all these great things, um, but you've got supply chains all over the world potentially, and some of those could be sitting in areas which are going to be more prone to flooding. Um, some of those areas are going to be areas where people are going to be struggling uh, because of famine, because of changes in weather patterns. And so there's actually huge threats to businesses uh, from uh, climate impacts around the world, which they might not see coming. Um, and so I think there's a, yes, there's opportunity, definitely, but people need to be aware of the threats to their businesses outside of their four walls. Um, and, uh, and, and that also goes to, I mean, people rec reference the oil and gas industry, and that, that's a really prime example, but there are many more of companies sitting with, with potentially stranded assets. So people have invested and people have got money tied up into technologies and areas which will, will no longer be a, a, a surplus on their books. They're going to be things which are um, a liability to them. Um, and so, uh, you know, you'll see hydrogen being pushed quite a lot um, by oil companies. And hydrogen could be a great technology. But at the moment, we do need to be pushing hydrogen to be produced um, through renewable electricity. Uh, and most of it is not. Most of it is produced um from fossil fuels and uh, and, and is, is not actually terribly it's slightly more positive but not that much more positive uh, and it's kind of really being used as another income source for for the fossil fuel industry um which is otherwise a stranded asset so i think there's um there, there are lots of threats that i think people need to be aware of um and those threats go to um, thinking about your wider impact so if you're a company um, you, you need to be yeah, addressing these, thinking about innovation, but also thinking about what the impacts of those are going to be on people, whether that's your staff or your suppliers or all the rest of the world. Um, again, fuel cells are a great example, fantastic technology. But when you're looking at fuel cells or electric and batteries, you know, what are the components made out of? You know, what's the en end of life uh, recycling or reclamation of those minerals? A lot of these things are conflict minerals or, you know, you think about gold, you think about palladium, all these things which need to be mined and resources which are finite and are dependent on how we supply, how, how we get them supplied from other parts of the world. So um, Kate Rayworth has got a great book on donut economics, uh, which talks about how we need to make sure we're, we're operating within, the, within our environmental bounds, so, um, but also not pushing down uh, socially on, on, on people, so uh, on, on, on social uh, impact. So, you know, yes, brilliant, create fuel cells, but while you're doing it, make sure you're not indirectly creating a negative impact on, on societies in other parts of the world. So that, that's got the, the global perspective is kind of huge like that. I think locally, you know, companies can look at that and say, 
you know, actually, what are the impacts on me, even if my supply chain aren't overseas? And uh, government legislation is changing, as Derek's particularly alluded to, um, and you're going to get left behind if you don't move quickly. Um, your customers and clients care about this stuff, and they are going to move if you don't move quickly. Um, and they might not well tell you, they will just move. Um, and so um, there are huge, huge challenges, barriers, and risks to businesses if they don't start to tackle climate change and, and biodiversity, which is even bigger threat, um, and start, as Louise mentioned, start talking about it, measuring it, and being honest and transparent about it. People are very, very cynical about greenwash. Um, and net zero seems to be the latest thing. Brilliant, but it's, it's being a bit greenwashy, kind of already <laughs> um, in, in a lot of areas. So, um, so yeah, I think opportunities and threats there. <laughs> How, how do you feel it's been a bit greenwashy, the 2050 net zero? Um, I think there's, uh, you know, so we are looking for net zero, but there's a really quick dash to uh, offsetting and offsetting not always in uh, terribly, uh, you know, uh, authentic ways. So, yeah. you know, essentially it's a kind of a, I can do what I like. I can fly as much as I like. I can have as much impact as I like, as long as I put a bit of money over here that's going to plant some trees somewhere in the world, yeah. honest gov. And, and, and we're kind of going, yeah, I, I can be as bad as I like as long as I assuage my guilt. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's not reality. Um, and so there's a real need to not just have policies in place and statements in place, but to uh, genuinely authentically say, actually, we need to de be decreasing our impact, uh, not just seeking to demonstrate we're offsetting it somehow. Is the governance in place, the rules in place? Because you talked about offsetting, because somebody, because a company, you know, we, we do see this, they can just spend lots and lots of money um, offsetting while actually producing a huge amount of carbon. Um, and in my mind, the offsetting is just for the bit that you can't reduce, you know, that, that's the bit that you should be going after, offsetting. Um, are there, you know, are there any rules in place when it comes to offsetting and should there be rules in place when it comes to offsetting? Um, what, what's, what's, the thought, what's the thoughts of the panel? So, um, if well, it's not exactly sensible to say, here's my problem and some money, you go solve it. Yeah. Is it? No. It's not really playing the game or rather yeah. it is playing the game. Yeah, yeah, it is. So where I saw it the most dramatically, if you go, let's say Ryanair and you can buy carbon offsets, it's about for a flight, it's about one pound fifty. Mm. I recently um, did some research on that and then noticed that Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates had invested in a company to do carbon offsets. And actually the cost of the carbon offset for the same flight is sixty dollars. So the greenwashing element of carbon offsetting is there in the yeah. fact that there's just no system to measure whether it's actually doing something. Mm -hmm. the, the, the company I'm referring to actually uses satellite imaging, not only plants trees, but it uses satellite imaging to check they're still there, that they're not being cut down, that things that the, the net benefit is positive. Mm -hmm. um, but that has a cost associated with it. And so when you see so much of the carbon offsetting websites, some of them really well-meaning, they're trying to do really interesting projects, but what is the, we're a scientifically based society, what is the real impact? How do you measure it? Measuring is really important. Um, and I just don't, I, this is the only people I've been able to find out who actually are remotely even trying to measure it, which is why I, I'm going to have to fly to the US for work. So work for an American company and it's probably going to cost me about $300, $400 in carbon offsetting. Mm -hmm. But that's that's the, the nate when it's done properly, this is how much it costs. Yeah. Yeah, it's I not like give give two pounds here, three pounds there. Yeah, and there are there are some standards kind of emerging, so gold standards for offsetting and this sort of thing. Uh, but it, they are kind of still emerging. And I think that's one of the key roles I mean, business has a huge role to play in tackling climate change, but, it, but it's not on its own. That's partly because it has great relationships. It, it produces, it manufactures, it creates wealth. It, it talks to customers, consumers, and can lead conversations and can lead governments as well in large, large ways. But governments have a big, big role. And internationally, governments have a, a huge role. And 
and obviously we've got the G7 going on and we've got COP, you know, coming up in Glasgow. And one of the things that governments have to do, as John's alluded to, really is measure the right things and set the right targets. And businesses can do that for themselves, but governments jointly need to be measuring and working out what the right things are to measure so that, you know, you can offset with tree planting in this country, offset tree planting in other countries, and there'll be very, very different systems and standards. And, and like John says, they might well just be cut down. And we know that the value for climate change and biodiversity of an existing woodland far surpasses a new uh, plantation. Um, so measuring, really important. Uh, and then aligning their incentives, government incentives, and doing it internationally so that there's a level playing field uh, and, uh, and people can't just you know, save money by moving around. But aligning incentives support better outcomes globally, not just locally. We're not just pushing our, 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 uh, our emissions overseas. And then they can help to drive socially useful innovation. Um, and so that's partly about grants, that's partly about incentives, it's partly about, again, setting the right targets for businesses. I think businesses are, we, we don't want to tell businesses what to do and how to solve the problems. And I think that's where governments sometimes fall, sh fall short. They kind of say, we think the future is, I don't know, say electric cars, go and build the best electric cars. Actually, businesses might have found a better way of solving the, the underlying problem than that. So governments need to really drive useful innovation, say this is the challenge, uh, use your innovation uh, to find the solutions to it. So, um, but that is an international effort um, and, and best tackled internationally by government. Yeah, and Elon Musk is a very polarizing figure, but he fundamentally says the government's role is not a player on the field, it's a referee. And when the government starts deciding what's gonna happen, it becomes a player on the field. But one of the things I think from my from my secondary school economics that I learned is that fundamentally for the last, well, since the um, 1945, we've operated in very rigged markets, which have been rigged to favour incumbents. So Shell, BP or the oil and gas industry generally. So if, when Elon Musk says I fully expected Tesla and SpaceX to fail. What he's doing is, is that there's no room, there's no room in this economy for investors who want to take value from markets they, because they know that the market is, is systemically rigged against them. And, and Elon Musk himself will say, I think it's a miracle that Tesla and SpaceX um, have succeeded, um, which I think is more to do with the attitude of Americans and their inquisitive and curiosity of new things and way of doing things better and, and investors who will, despite the mountain they've got to climb and the risk they know they faced in rigged markets, um, they did it anyway. And of course, they're winning big. But this is this is a real challenge where it comes to the government should be carbon pricing. If you price carbon, which is the problem, it will tend to drive private enterprise and, and private and, and investment into areas which are not carbon intensity intense because you'll simply get the returns in those carbon intensive activities will be very poor so they won't go there they'll go into something else so yeah keep the government off the field of play and just say we've got to cut carbon what's the best way of doing it and one of the things that interests me again about elon musk and his his ideas he actually doesn't want to sell cars it's not really his business model. He wants his robo taxes because he wants to fundamentally, it's about asset utilization. He wants to be able to make a car and earn income from it for a million miles. He doesn't want to sell it because that's a very, very poor return on investment. He's looking ride hailing. And I think things like ride hailing, e-mobility, personal e-mobility, uh, scooters, electric bikes, electrified public transport. I think it, it's, it, as, um, as um, Rod said, think, thinking differently about doing things. So Elon Musk would say, yeah, if you just replace all the cars on the road with electric cars, you just created another enormous problem. Solve the problem. What's the problem? Solving for X. And he, so he wants to fundamentally cut the number of cars on the road but use it as a way of earning, of taking an asset, which is a vehicle, and generating more returns from it for him and his investors. Yeah. 
It's like the Henry Ford quote, wasn't it? And he said that, you know, if you don't listen to his customers, you know, because they, they, you, I mean, I come from a business improvement um, and innovation background. And, you know, if you, and you, we're always told to, you know, do the voice of the customer, listen to the customer, what does the market want? And, you know, and Henry Ford said, you know, if you'd listened to the customer, they would have wanted a faster horse. You know, nobody would have told him to go and build a car. So it's that, you know, it's that, innovation isn't it that you know if, you know governments don't have that that site do they you know um, they don't have that they don't have the, um, you know but they the mustn't emerging uh, innovations yeah yeah but they mustn't allow markets to become rigged and conspire which is fundamentally what's happened with energy particularly is that they must not conspire with anybody to rig markets yeah. um and that's fundamentally what's happened in the energy industry. So it becomes very difficult. So if you look at Dale Vince and Ecotricity, he, he was an entrepreneur and he did it anyway. Um, but his growth, he hasn't, his growth hasn't exploded simply, but should have in a free market. But the market he's operating in is not free. Um, so he's pushing against um, not only business power, so businesses that have got too big and not been broken up like they should have to keep a market competitive, but also their political influence as well, um, which I think for, for people, entrepreneurs with small businesses and people with small businesses, family businesses, they are, they're, they're not being treated fairly um, because the opportunities to grow are, are being limited by the actual market in which should be letting them grow. Failure is a key component of free market capitalism. And the too big to fail argument is, is, is rotten, in my view, because that's been allowed to happen by politicians fundamentally, because they've allowed companies to get too big. So that shouldn't be happening in a free market. Those companies, as soon as they reach a particular market share, they should be broken up to drive innovation, to make those companies more competitive. Mm -hmm. um, and so many, if you look at the small businesses you work with, um, Zoe, look at how imaginative and creative they are. Whereas you go to a big corporate, you kind of almost want to, it becomes so depressing because there's just people performing automaton tasks. There's, there's nothing really vibrant going on there. I've worked. I've worked with both small businesses and and I've worked for large corporates. And yes, no, I would completely agree with that. And I've seen corporations swallowing up the smaller competitors and then just sucking everything out of them. The so they basically take the assets and then don't reinvest and then just and have, are able to grow and survive just through acquisition. And yeah, it it can be quite yeah it can. It's quite soul destroying when you see that happening to, to good good businesses. So, yeah. So, so the politicians are allow them to approach a monopolistic position. Yeah. This is and and if you were a small food manufacturer with a with an idea with a healthy option with just something different that you wanted to bring to market, it's so difficult because that market is stacked against you. So we're talking about the barriers. Are there any other barriers? We're on the subjects of barriers. So we've got governments and um, how it's rigged towards big business. Um, and those big businesses hold a huge amount of power um, in the world and over governments and, and whatnot. Are there any other barriers? What, what other barriers are do businesses have to tackling climate change? What about, Rod, what's your, what's your thoughts? Or? Roderick. I always say Rod. I, I, I don't know whether you're a Rod or a Roderick, and I keep going to call you Rod. <laughs> you know, most people call me Rob, uh, yeah. which is, yeah, which is why I put Roderick, because it makes it less likely. Um, but I, I answer to kind of most things, frankly. Um, uh, that's so, probably why. I probably, because I think um, I know your friend, don't I? And he's called you, uh, maybe that's why he's called you Rob, and I'm like, ah, it's Rod. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, anyway. So, um, uh, yeah, I think... The, the the challenges that kind of you refer to is, is a lot of it is perception um but but then there, there is reality too in terms of the feeling of things are too expensive uh, but i think a lot of it is a, a, as well about rigged markets that it can be depending on what, how the government puts things in place cheaper to do the wrong thing than to do the right thing um and um I, I, there's uh 
weirdly, I, I used to work at the Science Museum uh, up at Rawson, just uh, on the outside of Swindon. And um, the last time we had an opening back in 2009 up there, we, we, uh, we actually put on the runway three vehicles from around 1900. One was a petrol car, one was electric, and one was steam. Um, the steam car was the fastest, the electric second, the petrol car was a very, very poor third. Um, and, and if you think about how those technologies progressed, you know, they progressed along the lines of the oil company, um, really. Uh, and that's where the innovation, where the money's gone. And, so, and that's largely about, um, you know, the infrastructure and the systems we have in place. We still massively um, subsidize the fossil fuel industry um, and present this unlevel playing field. I think the, uh, John mentioned carbon um, pricing, which, which I think is, a, you know, the right thing to be talking about. I think the other thing we should talk about with uh, barriers to, to moving uh, to something which is, we know is better is about valuing what we see as free um, and, and specifically ecosystem services. Um, actually, the ecosystem that we live in provides a huge amount to governments and to people and to industry that we just don't pay for and we consider to be free. We take air, we take water, we take, we take nature, we go fishing in the, in the oceans and take fish out and think, oh look, free assets. And they're not free, they've been provided by nature, by, by, by biodiversity. And, uh, and actually the value that the biodiversity of the oceans provides to keeping us all alive is enormous. Uh, and if when we went and took fish out of the sea, we actually paid for that service that we were depleting, we couldn't afford to eat fish um, at all. Uh, and so governments can actually go, let's actually value things according to their actual value to, to us, as opposed to uh, allowing people to just strip out, um, strip out the value. Um, and, and so it's a kind of that distinction between um, harvesting and mining the earth, really. Um, and, and, and so government has got a real role internationally to say, actually, no, this is the value of these resources and we need to price them accordingly. Um, and and that's, that's about what you produce in terms of emissions, but it's also about the resources that you take and deplete. Um, and that plays really well into supporting businesses who want to innovate um, in circular economy. Um, actually, if you can make it easier for them to, uh, to make the business case for why they need to find an end use rather than just keep buying virgin raw materials that we've dug up from the ground, um, it makes them a hell of a lot easier for them to, to do that right thing and, and create a circular economy and still be competitive with their peers. And uh, businesses want to generate profit, they want to be competitive, um, and, uh, and, and, and th that's where the barrier often, often is, is can I do the right thing and still be competitive? And, and some things are moving in the right direction, but governments need to step up to, uh, to help that happen. Um, businesses are run by people, and generally, yes, people want to take home money, but generally people do want to do the right thing as well, uh, if government allow them to. Um, so I think there's a whole area <laughs> in, in, in that kind of uh, in that landscape, and, and again, that, that goes down to the local as well as uh, as the as the national. Um, you know, there are, there are chip shops who want to do the right thing, and actually, you know, if they can buy uh, materials uh, that you know, whether it's packaging, you know, polystyrene, brilliantly cheap way of packaging up uh, their chips, and actually, if you make that uh, more expensive. And, and actually more sustainable alternatives, cheaper, then they can do that and be competitive and they can talk to their customers about why they do it. So I think it, it works on every level, really. What's your thoughts, Derek? Because you provide a lot of solutions, don't you? So what, what's your thoughts on that? You know, I think probably the greatest barrier that we have as a society is the reluctance to embrace a new technology or uh, a new thing that is, that is emerging without there being the full and complete infrastructure in place for them to consider it, because that's never going to happen. So, you know, we, we have a situation where the progress of, for example, that the, the electric or the hydrogen vehicles that are, that are coming through, everybody is saying, well, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have an electric car because I'm going to need to, but I'm going to wait until there's one that does 500 miles as a return trip. On, on one charging. So I'm not going to do anything about that until there's a charging point every five miles. Or, you know, and there's there's always this 
just it's inbuilt in us there's this reluctance to embrace something before the whole completed picture is there it's safe we've asked our mum if it's all right if we can do it and you know i think that is one of the greatest barriers to get over when something is coming in embrace it as it is now and progress with it as time goes on i think business is quite innovating around that space as well though and there are historical examples um that you can always draw on the um there's uh I mean, weirdly, there's about 80 different tractors up at the Science Museum at Rawson. Uh, clearly, there's a curator who loved agriculture. Um, but there was one, there's one great engine up the agricultural engine, which was one of the first combustion engine agricultural engines. But it looks like a steam engine. It's got a boiler. It's got a chimney. And none of those things are functional. They're just there for show to make it look like the sort of technology people were used to buying. Uh, you know, and people talk about, you know, we have engines at the front of cars because that's where the horse used to be. Um, and that's where you expect the powertrain to come from rather than at the back. Uh, and uh, yeah, people do kind of, are, they kind of like the idea of new technology, but they also want it to be uh, comfortable uh, and, yeah. and reassuring. The at the front. What? <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, um, and companies can kind of, they're really good at kind of getting over that. Um, but but they do need they do need uh, government support too I think. We do like things the way they are though. I mean it's a natural human trait. I've just got into camping and I really want a campfire. And I'm like I can't have a campfire because I can't burn. You know I can't just burn stuff. That's just wrong and selfish of me. You know. But I'm like I really want to have a campfire. So I mean maybe I need to sort of find some um, when we have some proper green gas because I don't think we've got green gas yet. Um, but it's not too far away, hopefully, touch wood. So, um, you know, maybe we'll be able to replicate the fires through green gas. Who knows? But um, I don't think, yeah, it's, um, but we, we've all got this kind of, you know, we like the engines, don't we? We like, you know, we like looking at what those old engines look like and, and whatnot. And we do have that kind of sentimental attachment to, to think yeah. how they used to be. So how, how, how do people get over that? Well, I think it's just one of the weird things is that risk is a part of life. Yeah. So I grew up climbing trees, crashing bicycles. No one was trying to mollycoddle me. Yeah. I grew up having to assess risk. Whereas what I see in society is risk aversion in finance, in, in physical, in everywhere, to the point where our society has become stagnant. Um, and people think, oh, it's going to be zero risk. If someone thinks that driving an electric car with a 120 mile range is risky, they don't know risk fundamentally. I've done 30,000 miles in two and a half years in a car that had a 120 mile range. Um, never ran out, got stranded by the side of the road, just took a little bit of planning. And I think it was. Um, I think that that is an issue that we all fail catastrophically, ultimately, because as humans, we die. We can't get round that fact. So we will fail catastrophically. Failure is part of the human existence and that failure is a learning opportunity. And I think that's talked about a lot, but it's not really practiced. And, and people, a lot of people within businesses and jobs are fearful because they fear getting jumped on. Because if they do something wrong and it doesn't work, other people go, ah, look, that person didn't do it right. Oh, look at them. They must be stupid. No, no, no. That person's learning. Mm -hmm. That person's learning through failure. And I think um, this is this is a real issue. Risk taking and fear of failure and rather shaming people being shamed for failing instead of saying, well, wow, that guy, that man or woman, they tried. That's that's something that's worth celebrating. They tried rather than all they failed. They tried. What are they doing now? Well, they're trying to do it a different way. If you think of, you think of the guy, um, all the, the Industrial Revolution in Britain, the steam engine, how many times did he have boiler explosions and goodness knows what else before the steam engine became a reality? Well, if, if he'd been around now, we wouldn't get the steam engine because some risk manager somewhere would shut the idea down because it was too risky. So this is the thing, risk, yeah. being accepting risk, celebrating people who try, 
even if they fail and, and helping them along and not and saying, right, how do we that didn't work? Where do we go from here? What do we do now? Okay. I think this is a big part of the, uh, the, the, the puzzle. This is why I'm often I'm so often in awe of people who run small businesses and medium sized enterprises because they they do this every day. It's their money, their, their capital, their lives invested their pensions, everything, and they're running businesses that, that are fundamentally doing this. If something goes wrong, they have to fix the problem. That's the nature of the, the entrepreneurial nature of an SME. You have to fix the problem. You can't pretend it's not there. Whereas a failure a, or a multiple of failures is the badge of honour for the very successful. Yeah, well, Alan Sugar will tell you he's been a bankrupt. Yeah. And yet he is now a multimillionaire. Well, he, he didn't fear bankruptcy. Well, it's just an event in life. Yeah. So, yeah, I think this is really something um, that needs to be addressed. It, it, and it's the corporate itself, it's not the problem. It's the, it's the mentality it ingrains in people of the, the, the false sense of security um, where they think, oh, this will go on forever. But no, it won't. Nothing is forever. Yeah. And that their job is going to be more secure, the more risks they take and the harder they get their employer and their colleagues to push to do things differently, their job will become more secure. Do you it's think fear of failure, this, this that, that people have, is what stops us from changing. So we're talking about the oil markets, for example, and big established industries. And I've always wondered, why didn't they just 20 years ago just start on a long journey to pivot over to, to renewables. Why, why didn't they just do that? They must have seen this coming. You know, what, what is it that has kept, and it was, um, I think it was Sony as well, they did it, didn't they, in the music industry, they held on to the CD and they tried to stop um, the downloads and everything and it destroyed them in the end, you know? So what, what is stopping, you know? It's you all think? about control. Yeah. Yeah, control, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So they don't want to Very look spot on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's control and, and um, a natural tenant to be short termist. Frankly, I'm making money now. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, I can, the, the future can worry about itself, and it's essentially that's the entire reason why we are where we are with climate change. Really, we, we've essentially used up all our the next generation's resources, and 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 uh, you know capacity to pollute. Um, and we used we used up uh, you know the entire earth in a, in a couple of generations really uh, because we are still quite short termist. Um, so and risk, uh, I, I don't know about we've become more risk averse. We're really bad at measuring risk and understanding risk. If we were risk averse, we would not set foot in a car filled with petrol. Um, you know, actually that's far more risky in many ways than like a hydrogen vehicle or or the range anxiety of an electric vehicle. Um, and we, we're just very, very poor at measuring and understanding it. We tend to revert back to the, uh, what is reassuringly uh, familiar. Um, and so stepping away from the familiar, we, it feels risky uh, and it feels like we're losing control. Um, and so I think, you know, the government does have a role again, it, as, as the businesses in helping consumers to, uh, to adopt the new and to recognize the new as being a positive step forward. I and, just, and I think there's a, there's a go on, Lee, sorry. I was gonna say, can I jump in and, and build on that? But mm. actually not just, are we really bad at um, perceiving risk as human beings? We're also really bad at perceiving impacts and the reality of what is the right thing to do? What is, what does sustain, what is the most sustainable choice? So great example, um, we'll all remember the, the Blue Planet moment and all of the publicity around plastic straws were suddenly the devil and uh, you know the biggest environmental impact. Yes, they are, plastic in oceans is a massive problem, but it is far, far, far from the biggest environmental issue. And suddenly you've got businesses scrabbling to get rid of plastics, get rid of single use plastics. And it's great that they're doing that, but they're still, you know, they're shouting about the fact that they've made these plastic free changes. Some of the things they've moved to, actually, when you look at the overall footprint of move, producing some of the different packaging that they use, is actually much bigger than the plastics waste. Uh, even if they are using sustainable solution, they're still, you know, it's just scraping the surface of it, of what they're actually doing. Um, 
so there's, there's definitely a role for businesses i think to play in educating people about sustainability more generally and what are the right choices rather than just picking a bag the latest bandwagon jumping on that and ignoring their overall impact so yeah but what you will see as well are, are a number of companies doing the the right thing by by changing the packaging doing all of this sort of thing yeah. um but then they will spend five six seven ten times as much as the cost of making that change on telling everybody about it yeah yeah so, I mean, uh, why 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 not do it the other way around if you know exactly right. i think it's yeah great. if you're going to invest invest in doing the right thing and yes absolutely tell people about it but there's too many companies that make a great big song and dance about what is a very small change um rather than putting that money into making bigger impact for good i've, I've worked in business improvement and you know the one of the, the themes that seems to be coming up here a lot is measurement and metrics so we've talked about looking at how do we measure risk and how do we measure whenever we make a change there's you know there's obviously an impact to that change how do we measure what the impact is so <coughs> how bad you know okay so we had this plastic piece of packaging and now we've changed over to this how do we measure that that change has been a positive change you know it may just be um, quite often, it seems to be that it's the change um, that they want to tell people about. We've eliminated plastic, but then, you know, they've added something else into the mix. So how how do we get away from that? How do we get away from um, that sort of business? It's carbon budgeting, isn't it? Yeah. It's actually having a system that measures actually the the net benefit of what's being done. Um, just like a financial system, it's num if you can use numbers in a database, you can drive progress. So just like you've got an P&L account, um, expenses, whatever it is, earnings figures, you can put those into a number. And if the number looks bad, you know that what's being done is bad. If the number looks good, you know what's being done is good. Um, so it's it, it, that I see, and I, I don't know if any, the, the other panelists agree, that I see is a, as a key driver because then someone can physically look at it and say, that doesn't look good. Basically, we, we made this change thinking it was going to be better, but actually it's worse um, fundamentally. Yeah, I think, well, I think, yeah, carbon's big. I think the sustainable development goals are a really good starting point and, we know we are, you know, where we are with climate change is pretty horrendous. Where we are with biodiversity is, is even worse. Um, and, and so you kind of need to measure a broad range of things. And investment needs to follow uh, where the overall impact is. So I've never been in any business which, when it made a decision, whether it's a huge decision in the organization or a small one, that didn't consider the financial impact of that decision, um, whether positive or, or negative. Um, and, and that the same thing should be said for all decisions businesses make, uh, what the impact is for people and planet. Um, but what businesses need uh, is how do we measure that? How do we measure that in a way that makes sense uh, and is consistent? Because, you know, no businesses don't sit with the best scientists of the world on their boards and in their teams. Um, they've got brilliant accountants but they know what to measure with the finances. And I think business needs to be equipped with what are those measures, whether that's, uh, you know, as John says, with, with carbon and carbon pricing uh, or, or with how, how they're affecting resources. You know, we, we've been really good at improving the lot of workers in terms of rights and HR legislation. Um, so we know that we can do this. Uh, it's a, it is a wicked problem, but, but not one that we can't tackle. And, and, and that's a kind of collaborative thing between businesses, government, and I think the financial sector investment needs to consider uh, when it invests, uh, what the impacts are, are going to be and what the overall costs are going to be beyond the pure financial. Really quite measurable in my industries. You know, the, the, the last installation that I did, I know for a fact, because figures are sitting in front of me, they've got a 68.8 tonne CO2 offset per year. You know, it, it's really easy to measure in, in those terms. Where it gets confusing for people is when we keep creating acronyms for various different things, you know? So we've, we've had our, our corporate social responsibility 
We've now morphed a little bit more into environmental social governance. Um, you know, but when when people in business, when when members of the public who are not used to speaking, you know, in the acronyms, when they see those things come up, it's like, meh, yeah. you know. So we, we we need to promote these things in a way where you can say, look, this is the good I'm doing with this. People call it this, but this is what it really means. If we could yeah. get over that, it would help us an awful lot. I take it we don't have one of them. You talked about some standards, I think somebody mentioned on how to measure this, but are there, is there a standardized way that all businesses globally could follow? And do we need that? And, and I'm thinking like an ISO standard, something along those lines. There, there are. There yeah. are, but, but but you see, where you're talking about a solar panel installation, it's pieces of equipment that are measurable, and that is it. That That is where you get your figure from. But when you've got a policy and you've got a number of different things all interacting with each other, my gosh, that's difficult to even look at, let alone try and calculate properly. There's a certain amount of rule of thumb on that as well. Um, you know, so again, I, I have the luxury of being able to pretty much tie it down to within point something of a ton. Um, whereas when you've got multiple things going on, no, that's that's when it gets too complicated to be too accurate on. Mm. Yeah, you I'm need a very way. Sorry, go, go on, John. You need a very robust system that 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 requires all businesses in the supply chain to report carbon intensity otherwise as um as derek says it, it's impossible if, mm -hmm. if you don't if your supplier can't tell you the carbon intensity of a piece of equipment or a pro or a milk or whatever it is that you're buying in you're lost effectively you can't even begin to do it it's you're done for how does the supplier do that does is is there a, a set way for the supplier to do that <laughs> No, well, that's the too, problem. So too many, too many variables in it. You know, you, okay, so even in my example, okay, so you, you, you know, you can put on your, your company website that this is what we've done, this is where we've been very careful on it. But what you can't see are the additional offsets that happen within the business because that thing's happened. You, you can't see... The, the the sort of the 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 extra bits the the bits that spin off from what that initial installation can can do for you because maybe that will then lead on to to four other people that are employees um that that you know can charge at, at the premises or do, do do you know what i mean there's no you can only make your bold statement on the basic facts yeah. but everything yeah. else you can highlight down the line, we've discovered that this has happened, but quantifying it, really difficult. Yeah, I think making bold statements is a challenging thing anyway, really, uh, because um, I, I think you, you, the only way to, for most businesses, the only way to reduce their carbon footprint to zero is to cease trading. And, um, uh, you know, and I kind of often think about that. How do I make my life more carbon neutral? Well, I could probably die and that would help my carbon footprint disappear. That'd be, that'd be, but only once we're, you're decomposed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's some sort of a trail on that. Um, but I think there's, there's, I think businesses that when it comes down to authenticity and transparency uh, and where you get the kind of the feeling of greenwash is you make bold statements about one thing and then someone says, well, what about this? And you kind of get this Greta Thunberg effect. Of she's, her messages are brilliant and what she's doing is brilliant. But quickly people go, oh, look, but she used air conditioning. Uh, so she's a hypocrite. Uh, and, and businesses face this as a challenge to actually moving in the right direction. So every time they move in the right direction and say they move in the direction, someone say, but what about this? Uh, and so there's a kind of helping create that, um, th that way for companies to be transparent, talk about the journey they're on. Mm -hmm. Actually, we are looking at our supply chain. We never knew this was what our impact was before. If and only now we were all breathing out, we could it, reduce the CO2. Quite, quite. Um, you know, if I run less, uh, then, then I, will, I, will, I will use less energy. Uh, but um, I think there's, uh, there's that thing about how do we tell the story in a way which says, 
look, there's some really, really, fun, there's a fantastic future that we can create here. Uh, and that is, you know, with the green economy, we can, we can actually make the world a better place uh, than, it, than it's headed to be uh, by improving our energy efficiency, by improving what we do with biodiversity. Um, you know, we can make, uh, on the side of that, make the air cleaner for you to breathe and healthier for your children to live in. It's not a bad thing we are trying to do here. Um, but we are on a journey to do it. And the part of what we're doing is measuring and making changes and going in the right direction. Uh, and, and I think uh, c companies need those tools and need to be able to go, look, you know, we, we are doing good things. We are having a purpose for society, but we, we know that we have impacts and this is the journey we are on uh, to improve that. And they need to do that with their consumers and they need to do that with government support. Um, but I think, you know, there is a positive future uh, that businesses are an absolutely critical part in delivering. So on a final note and a final question, um, so the final question, what, in terms of in international business, and I'll just follow on from what um, Roderick just said there, what are the key things that businesses can do to impact climate change um, going forward from, um, from an international point of view as well? So what do you think should the the key things that businesses can do to drive the fight against climate change? Wow. Big question. Yeah. On, on, on a business level, yeah. just consider making things better than they have been for themselves yeah. in business. That's a step towards the bigger picture has to be dealt with by the people that we elect to put into place the, the direction we should be going in. And, and what that needs is cooperation between them, because you, you shouldn't always be on the lowest common denominator. You should you should be at the highest specification that everybody can agree on so that there's a shared vision yeah. rather than just a, 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 you know, a small colloquial opinion. Because I don't believe really governors, people who politicians are actually driving the way on anything. I think that people and the businesses are. I think that they follow people in the business. That that's kind of that that's that's my that that's the just best, the best governments. Yeah. Are the governments that have the best advisors? Yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's the advisors that we need to be approaching, not not the people who are the figureheads. Yeah. I think the um, you know government has a huge role, um, as does finance and, and and people. I think, as far as business is concerned, um, there's a really good report called Rewiring the Economy by Cambridge Institute of Sustainable Leadership, and they they kind of set out four four basic things that businesses should be doing. And the first one is aligning their organisational purpose, their strategy, and their business models. Mm -hmm. So within the commercial context, they need to explicitly set out how they are going to improve people's lives and operate within natural and uh, boundaries of the planet. They need, the second thing is set evidence-based targets, measure them and be transparent about them, which we touched on a lot. Uh, the third thing is to embed sustainability in their practices and their decision-making. So the same way you embed risk and finances in all decision-making, you embed sustainability into it. And then that fourth thing is, is about the talking. It's about engaging, it's about collaborating, and it's about advocating change. And businesses can play a huge role in that acting between the other different actors in society. Yeah, I love that, yeah. What's your thoughts, John? What are your final thoughts on, on what business can do to um, create change, positive change in the environment? Steve Jobs said, why employ smart people if you're going to tell them what to do? Employ smart people and they will tell us what to do. Yeah. So value your employees value their intellectual capacity, listen to your employees and engage them. I think it's just saying what's been said another way, um, but there is no accident that Apple was the world's first trillion dollar company and it takes 80% of the market value from 20% of the market share. This is the, the example. Look at Apple as an example. Look at what they do. Look at how people laughed at Steve Jobs when he first launched the iPhone. Look at the value of that business now in 15 years. 
that's grown. It's a values-based business. It's not, it's a it's a, it's what's called value add rather than cost destruct. Focus on the value add, not the destruction. The destruction of value, focus on the creation of value. That's a good point. Good point. So yeah. Thank you everyone for joining the, the panel. It's been a really, really interesting discussion and yeah, it's, it's been good. So um, yeah, thank you. And I'll just say goodbye. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.